Arash, Prince of the Sky, Chapter 11, Full Circle. A full day had passed since Arashi and Ishar returned to the physical earth. Burmi and everyone else was overcome with joy with the reality that Ishar was amongst them again, and as a bird nonetheless. They spent a good portion of the day indoors at their dining room table. While the repairman came to replace the door on their home, after the attack, Nanabe used her powers to try to convince the witnesses of that night that there was a gang-related incident. Not a monster, but a lot of things got destroyed. Burmy whipped up a buffet of food and popped the champagne open for mimosas. She wanted the full scoop. Everyone was excited about Ishara's return, but at the same time, concerned because her presence meant that there would be more trouble in the near future. They sat and talked in detail about the past 15 years. Arashi was more than happy to translate what his sister was saying to him, to the rest of the family. He shied away from talking about his own experiences growing up. He didn't want to get too deep. Not that he needed to. Ishara knew him like the back of her hand, and she sympathized with his current condition. Burmy cried joyfully and shed tears as she reflected on the moments she and Ishara had all those years ago, especially the last time she saw her at Niagara Falls. It was heartbreaking and beautiful. Funny part is, he was actually there for some of those moments, just swimming around his fishbowl until the destruction of the veil allowed him to transform. Before they knew it, the sun had gone down and Bremi was emotionally exhausted and definitely ready for bed. The curse on Ari's arm was under control for now, but each moment that went by without them looking for a cure made him feel anxious. His mood turned dark when he realized that they spent the day acting like everything was okay, but he knew his time was running out. He slipped into his room after dinner and crawled under the covers, hoping they would all take his dilemma more seriously, because come morning, he was going to go see Nagu, regardless of who was with him. He took several long breaths to calm his mind, in and out, until his mind drifted off into a deep sleep. A blue diamond spun soundlessly in the dark. It illuminated a warm glow like a star. The sound of broken glass echoed into the dark as the diamond continued to spin. Wake up! Brother, wake up! Arashi! He opened his eyes. He was covered in sweat. The cool in his room made him shiver. He looked down to see Ishara perched on his chest, her bird beak just inches from his nose. Get up. It's time to go see Nagu. He wiped the sleep from his eyes and looked over at the clock on his desk. The time read 5.15 a.m. Ishara, what the hell? Why are we leaving so early? Mom probably isn't even awake yet. Let me get like two more hours. We can't wait for her. I had a vision. The safest thing for us to do is go on without her. Trust me. He took a deep breath and turned back over onto his back. He couldn't shake the feeling that she was right. He was trying to remember the dream he had. His soul was that diamond. He knew that much, but it cracked. Exactly why we need to get a move on, brother. That curse is doing its job. Of course she knew his dream. She knew everything. Okay, so... Why is leaving mom behind a better idea than going without her? No Shy or, or Nana either? He flung the covers off of himself, and she fluttered over to the desk. No. Look, certain things have to happen in order for... Stop asking me all these questions, brother. Just get your stuff on and let's go. Okay, fine. He agreed, but he started reaching his mind out past her thoughts and into her mind's eye. But she blocked him with an impenetrable diamond barrier around her memories of sight. She flew up to his face and started pecking at his head. He raised his hands up and tried to brush her away. Idiot! You try that again, I'll be the fear you really need to worry about. Okay, ow! Stop! Okay, I'm sorry! Jeez! Hypocrite! I am not you, idiot. You know how these things work. You need to act naturally. If you try to change the future, you mess it up. And we don't have time for mistakes here. Your chakras need to be open. That's what our mission is, finding these stones. Fear is aware that you are aware, so now it's a game of chess. He's already made the first move. We need to be smart and prepared. Okay, well, I don't know how to play chess. Doesn't matter. You're the piece. I'm the player. 
You have to trust me. Okay, I do. Good, this hula. Do you know what that is? Mm-mm. It's your throat chakra. It's how you're able to express your thoughts and feelings accurately. Yours is open, for now. Even though you still cannot speak here on Earth, your true thoughts were spoken while we were in the veil of the moon. I didn't know it then, but it was clear to me once you spoke. You spoke the truth, something no one can take away from you. It also allows you to wield your powers to work for you. Even though your human body couldn't maintain the full extent of your spirit powers, you still have a glimmer of your true self back. Cool. So, how do we make sure it stays that way? It's all about balance, brother. Mantras help to keep your spirit aligned. Try this one. I bow to the creative energy of the infinite. I bow to the divine channel of wisdom. I emanate grace, peace, and love. Like a light bulb. <laughs> that last part is funny. Okay, I understand. I'll keep that in mind. I do feel clearer, though. It feels nice. He started heading to the door. Of course it does. Being balanced and connected feels amazing. Stop! We need to go out the window. Oh, gotcha. He'd nearly forgotten that Nanabe and Shimari were still in the house. They didn't feel secure leaving after the attack, so they stuck around to keep watch out. They were taking shifts staying awake just in case. It was Bishop's turn now, and there was no way his father was going to let him leave like this. So he opened the window quietly and looked out. The sun was starting to light the sky, and they had to make their way to the train quickly. He did a double take of the street to make sure no one was coming. Then he took a deep breath and leapt out. The cool morning air rushed past his face as he landed on his feet like a feather. Ishar fluttered down after him and landed on his shoulder. He did a quick jog down the block until he was out of sight of his own building, and then walked normally. Hey, uh, what do you think happened to the moon spirit? Not sure. She's out there somewhere, or else the world would be in chaos right now. Mm. Yeah. Ishar, what does it mean to be in love? Well, brother, I'm really not the one to ask because I can't speak from experience. But from what I can tell, love can be complicated. It can either be a really beautiful thing that helps you grow, or it could be the type of love that causes you to wither. It's up to you to be wise when it comes to love. You have to be careful with who you give your heart to, and with who gives their heart to you. He thought about that for a moment. All this love talk made him think about what he loved, or who he loved. Sure, he loved Burmy and Bishop, Nanan -nan Shai, but who did he love? No one ever seemed to pique his interest. He wondered what that moment would feel like when he experienced true love. Would he know that it was love? He hoped it wouldn't be a surprise. He hated surprises. You will know. They waited for the train to pull into the station and got in the car. The train was already filling up with people. No one was in the mood to talk or smile, but they did stare at him. Wasn't every day a boy walked in with a blue jay on his shoulder. He just gave them a regular resting piss off face and waited for a stop. When they got off the train, it was just in time to catch the rising sun. It was gonna be a beautiful day. The sky was clear and colors danced across the skyscrapers. The magic of New York City was in full effect. Ishara took flight and decided to cruise around to get a bird's eye view. He watched her go and remembered the days he would fly freely through the sky and above it all, free and without a real care in the world. She felt his longing and reached out her mind to his. Then suddenly, his sight was hers. His body still in the streets, but also flying the skies with her. It was beautiful. The sunrise from the sky was unequivocal. But just as she was climbing higher, he felt a presence near him that alarmed him. It wasn't danger, it was something else. He pulled his mind back into his body and suddenly locked eyes with the boy around his age. He had this intimidating look about him. Oh, it's him. It was the boy from the train that he'd seen the other day. He wore blue jeans and a tiger t-shirt. He looked like crap, like he had a rough night, but that didn't mask the fact that he was a beautiful guy. Something in his spirit drew Arashi in, but at the same time frightened him. It was only for a moment, but his heart started beating out of his chest. They were staring at each other like they'd never seen another human being before. His hazel eyes were intoxicating. Arashi managed to keep his face neutral, but his insides were bubbling with butterflies. 
the boy looked like he was about to say something, but his face contorted up like he was in pain. He noticed that his watch was screeching like an alarm was going off. The boy turned his back and leaned up against the building. Arashi was going to ask if he was okay, but he thought otherwise. He should keep moving. He took a deep breath and kept walking. Everything okay? Yeah, he's, he's fine. I, I, I mean, I, yes, I'm fine. Come down. I'm crossing the street to Nagu. Go on. I'll keep my distance. I want to check something out. He shrugged his shoulders nonchalantly and wondered if she knew. What? Of course she knows. She knows everything. Nagu was behind the counter with his back turned. Arashi heard him cursing under his breath in Creole. He cleared his throat and realized he had no way of communicating with Nagu. How the hell was he going to get answers out of him? <sighs> he just waited patiently for him to turn around. Then he heard a voice behind him. Uh, hey, you need some help? When he turned around, he was face to face with that boy again. He looked at him, shaken on the inside, but trying to hold his blank stare. Woo! Shoot! Okay. What are we gonna do? Okay. Chill. Be cool. Be cool. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a card. It read, I'm speaking impaired. He handed it to the boy and gestured for him to turn it over. On the back, it said, Hi, my name is Ari. The boy looked back at him with a mixed expression that was happiness and surprise. What was he thinking? Oh, dude, that's cool. Nice to meet you, Ari. Is that how you say it? My name is Shay Cody Shay, but you could just call me Cody. Cody held out his hand for Arashi to shake it. He looked down at his hand, then back at him. He didn't like shaking hands, but he didn't want to be rude, so he shook it. The warmth was like nothing he'd ever felt before. The goosebumps shot up the back of his neck and down to his feet. His heartbeat was racing as well, but the screeching coming from Cody's watch was almost at a peak. He snatched his hand back as Cody tried turning the watch off. Oh, my bad. It was a gift from a homie. It was only supposed to go off around electrical stuff. He said, taking the watch off and putting it in his back pocket. Arashi made note of that and smiled to himself. If only he knew that he was standing next to a human lightning bulb. Arashi backed up a couple steps so there was space between them. He was extremely nervous now. He shut down when he got nervous. Then, Cody did something very surprising. He started using sign language to communicate with him. How long have you been speaking in pair? Arashi was shocked, stunned, but he managed to answer him back. Um, the entire time I've been here, how do you know sign language? Cody was a bit thrown by his answer, but he replied anyways. My mother was hearing impaired. I've used sign language my entire life as well. I haven't used it since she... Anyways, yeah. Cody said, careful not to trigger a memory that he didn't want to deal with at the moment. Hmm, this guy is definitely interesting. And the timing couldn't be more perfect either. Hmm, Arashi thought. But he couldn't shake the feeling that there was something much deeper about this boy. And frankly, he didn't know what to do with all the thoughts running through his mind. He involuntarily licked his lips and realized they were staring at each other. Wow, he's beautiful like, like a tiger, Arashi thought, and it triggered a vague but familiar memory in him for only a moment. It felt like he's known this boy before. Um, what's going on? When Ishara appeared in his thoughts, he snapped out of it and tried laughing it off. The awkward staring contest, that is. He asked Cody if he could ask Nagu some questions for him. Sure. Yeah, I got you. Cody said, smirking at him, and then banging on the counter of the newsstand. Hey, Nagu! Wake up, old man! You got a visitor! Nagu turned around. He had been completely engulfed by whatever he was looking at, and was shocked to see Adachi standing in front of him. Oh my goodness! Young friends! Oh my gosh! Good morning! What a surprise! Look at ya! Getting all big and strong like your papa, looking just like your mama! Nagu squalled, leaning over the counter to shake his hand enthusiastically. Where bury me be at? She not with ya? He asked him. He was much more excited than Arashi was prepared for. He shook his head no. Aha, uh -huh, I see, I see. Well, tell her she needs to bring her tail down here to pay this old man a visit. I do enjoy our talks. Anyway, I see you met my apprentice here, she she. Good lad he is, good lad. Nagu shot Cody a wink. Cody gave the old man an embarrassing look of disapproval. Yeah, thanks, Nagu. Hey, he got something he want to ask you. 
I am sure he do. He didn't sneak out the house at 6 a.m. to say he in that right young prince. Ari was caught off guard for a moment. His eyes widened, then he grinned because he called him out. Dang, <laughs> he is good. Arashi smiled and gathered his composure so that he could relay to Cody what he wanted to ask Nagu. The stone you gave his mother, the Everstone, where did you get it? Nagu brought his hands up to fondle his long beard. His bushy brows furrowed and he looked deep into Arashi's eyes for some deeper meaning behind his question. Cody just looked back and forth between them, confused. Ah, the Everstone. Those stones be extra rare. Possibly the rarest stones on earth, boy. They come from an ancient time in an ancient land where the Nile's been running deep since the rise of the pyramids. In Africa? Yes, in Africa. Don't hit her out. Oops, my bad. The stones, they have to find you, which is what makes them so rare. It was a unique formation of elements that created them. It possesses extremely high vibrations for whatever the wielder soul chooses. Who knows what power they wield? Arashi was listening to all this very intently and was puzzled. How was he to find the stones if the stones had to find him? Ishara had fluttered down and landed on top of the newsstand, unnoticed. I don't have an exact address, but have you ever heard of the ancient city of Fez in Morocco, Northern Africa? They have held on to some of the oldest traditions in the world, and they be the owners of the largest collections of crystals anywhere. If the stones still exist, that's where they'll be, Nagu said, breaking his focus to assist someone who had walked up to the newsstand to buy a paper. Africa? How the hell are we going to get to Africa? Arashi said to Ishara. His frustration was starting to build. It seemed like an impossible mission to somehow get to Africa, of all places and then actually find the stones that are lost somewhere in an entire city. He put his hands to his temple and closed his eyes to try to calm the electricity starting to surge in his body. Cody walked back just in time for his watch to start whistling again from his pocket. He looked toward Ashi, puzzled, but was now starting to realize that the watch was actually reacting to him. It wasn't broken. It was doing exactly what Paul programmed it to do. He clicked a button on the watch to make it stop while he watched Ari through slit eyes as he drank his 50 cent cup of coffee. Relax, we will find a way. Ishara mentioned. Nagu finished with his customer and came back to finish his story. Here, take this boy. It's not much, but it should help if you narrow down your search when you find yourself in an ancient city. Nagu handed Ashi a card with a symbol on it. It was a mandala. Arashi took the card and observes it in detail. It was very old. Very, very old. You find this symbol. You find what you're looking for. I'm sorry, but that'll be all the info I got to give. Hope it does you some good. Arashi bowed to Nagu, thanking him for his help. Hey now, just watch yourself out there, young prince. The wolves be hiding in sheep's clothes, you hear? Give be my love. Arashi backed away from the newsstand so other people could get their items. Cody excused himself from Nagu for a moment. As Nagu watched him with careful eyes, he sensed something in the boy's energy had changed. What worried him was that he didn't know if it was good or not so good. Make the right choice, boy. All set, young prince? Hey, are you like an actual prince, like the Prince of Harlem or something? <laughs> Cody joked. Arashi blushed and rolled his eyes. <laughs> no, it's just a nickname my parents gave me. He lied. He couldn't possibly tell him that he was in fact the prince of the sky, or that his actual parents were the sun and the moon. Okay, cool, cool. So, what's your next move? Um, Morocco. Somehow. I guess. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. So you're just gonna go to Africa, just like that? For some stones? Arashi stopped walking and turned towards Cody. His face was confused and in slight disbelief. Arashi folded his arms and put his best confident look on. He didn't know how or when, but he knew he was going to get there. Cody just looked at him, impressed by his conviction. He smiled at him, but the sudden sound of police sirens pulling up spooked him. Uh, hey, hey, let me walk you to the train. Hey, yo, Nagu, I'll be right back. Cody slung his arm around Adashi's shoulder as they walked. His sudden comfortability with him felt odd, but even more odd that he didn't mind him doing it. He hated being touched by people, least of all strangers, but... Cody hadn't given him any reason not to trust him. 
But what Ashi didn't know was that Cody was holding on to him to keep from falling over in panic. Careful, brother. Ishara warned, flying from lamppost to lamppost, trying her best to stay unnoticed. Oh, Ishara, relax. If he tries anything, I'll just break his neck. Not what I meant. Okay, then what do you mean? Arashi was just a little smaller than Cody, so his arm fell perfectly into the groove of his neck. He could smell his sense of musk and Axe body spray. You and I both know this boy likes you. He was caught off guard by her cavalier attitude, but Cody started speaking before he could respond to her. Man, Africa? I'd give him my left nut to go to Africa. ASAP. Arashi laughed at his crass comment, but it wasn't lost on him that he knew exactly what he meant. Every word. Uh, no. Okay, Ishara, shut up. They arrived at the entrance to the train. It was rush hour at this point. People were bustling and rushing in and out of the station like robots. They leaned up against the side of the building so as not to get caught in the crowd. Cody reached into his pocket and pulled out a joint. He lit it and asked Ari if he wanted any. He shook his head and just watched Cody smoke it, surprised that he had the audacity to light a joint in the middle of the street. He watched Cody in silent curiosity. Hmm. <laughs> What is this guy going through? He wondered. Cody's dis-ease was clear, but he needed a friend. Arashi took a deep breath and pulled himself out of his daze and let Cody know that he had to get moving before his mother worried. Oh, okay, man, uh, no problem. I, I didn't mean to keep you hanging. He said, dropping the joint to the ground and snuffing out the flame with his Nikes. He held out his hand for Arashi to take it. Feeling his tender squeeze, Arashi didn't want to let go. Cody made him nervous in ways he had not felt before. I hope we get to see each other again, soon. Cody had a longing in his eyes. He didn't want to see him go, not yet. Not when they just met. Cody had so many questions, but more importantly, he needed an escape. He thought if he got close enough to Arashi, he might be able to catch a ride out of here. Suddenly, Ishara came swooping down from her post in front of them, causing them to separate. She fluttered and landed on Arashi's shoulder. Whoa! Holy crap, that is crazy! Ishara, what is your deal? Dude, is that bird yours? It's a blue jay, right? I've never seen anyone have one as a pet. Yeah, she's with me. A bit retarded and territorial. I, I gotta run. Bye. Adashi signed, backing away while trying to pull his eyes away too. Cody raised his hand and waved bye. The longing in his eyes almost heartbreaking. Adashi turned and skipped down the steps. <sighs> That was completely uncalled for, Tweety Bird. Relax. You'll see him again. <laughs> Wait, really? She didn't respond, but he could feel her smiling. His heart smiled in anticipation as well. End of chapter 11. Chapter 11.